Ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me uh, welcome you to the United States Institute of Peace. Um, my name is Bill Taylor, and I do the post-conflict work here with a lot of my, my colleagues. Um, uh, we put uh, Iraq in post-conflict category, General Kaslan. Um, and we are very honored uh, to have General Kaslan here with us, uh, the commander of the 25th Infantry Division in Hawaii, but uh, recently you will notice uh, two stars on the general shoulders right now. Uh, he's been nominated, uh, and if the Senate agrees, we'll have three stars when you, when you see him very soon, and we'll go uh, to Fort Leavenworth um, to take over all of the Army's training um, at, uh, at Fort Leavenworth. So we're very pleased to have him here. This is an important time for the United States, an important time for Iraq, um, because of all that's going on and will be going on over the next two years. Um, General Kaslan is particularly well suited to describe what has happened from his time in uh, multinational division north uh, in Iraq for his year there uh, as the commander. Um, but he's also particularly well qualified to talk about what's going to happen over the next two years. And this will be interesting for us as it applies to Iraq. And also there are lessons to be learned, I suspect, um, about uh, Afghanistan, and where we are going through similar kinds of things that General Kaslan has, has already seen. So um, what we will ask General Kaslan to do is give you a probably a half hour, 45 minutes worth of his observations from his time there, and then have another half hour, 45 minutes uh, opportunity to ask questions, and there will be opportunity for you to come to the mics um, uh, of him, and he will take it from there. So without further, John Kessel, thank welcome. You thank, you thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, but I appreciate it. It's really good to be here, and I really uh, value the opportunity to talk to you about Iraq and uh, the fact that we just left multinational division north, and, and I appreciate it. I know with all the different competition that's going on inside Washington today, with uh, the testimony that's going on in the Hill with General McChrystal and Ambassador Eikenberry, and given the weather with all the rain and everything else, to, to see such a great crowd, I really appreciate it. It's good to see you, and thank you very much for coming and, and for attending. As I was leaving Iraq, I left uh, in the beginning part of November from multinational division north, and as I was leaving, I knew that some of the former divisions that had departed had put a, a briefing together that talked about what they had accomplished while they were there. And I was talking to General Odierno and showed it to him and he said, you know, you really need to take this briefing and talk to some of the different think, t think tanks in Washington. Uh, so we contacted some of our contacts and the U.S. Institute of Peace has decided to accept our offer. And I just want to say a special thanks to U.S. Institute of Peace for doing that, sir. So thank you very much uh, to give you the opportunity to do this. I think Iraq is at the crossroads of a lot of tremendous opportunities that are there. Uh, as you know, they're going into the elections, which were going to be in January, but now are going to be pushed off to the end of February, early March. But the successful elections and the successful and safe and secure elections and transfer uh, uh, from one government to the other is going to be a huge and significant event. While we were in Iraq, uh, we saw the successful transfer of the provincial governments, and it made a huge difference in the ability to govern which was critical in the development of that country and to counter the insurgency. Uh, also at stake is the resolution of, and one of, our, one of the significant problems of, of Iraq, which was in our area, and that was the resolution of the disputed areas between Kurdistan and uh, the Arab portion of Iraq, and, which was uh, the Kurd Arab issue, and I'm going to talk a, a lot about that. I uh, commanded MND North, and in MND North, uh, I was responsible for an area the size of approximately the state of Ohio. It was Baghdad North, it had a total of seven provinces. It had the four Arab provinces of Saladin, Diyala, uh, Kirkuk Province, and Nineveh Province, and it also had the three Kurdish provinces of the Hook, Salamania, and Erbil. Uh, it was very, very interesting. You had a whole diverse set of issues, and I'll talk you through some of those particular issues as a scene setter. And, um, and, and, and what I'd like to do, if I can get the next one, Chris, there, the next slide, on this particular agenda, and I, and I apologize for some of you who can't see the slides, and I'll walk you through them, but this kind of helps me with some of the notes. What I do want to talk to you about for about a half hour or so is I do want to give you uh, an assessment of my area from uh, each one of the province and some of the significant issues with each province and some of the drivers of instability that we saw. And I also then want to transition and talk to you 
about uh, our mission and how that mission evolved, I want to talk to you about the security agreement, which really was significant. And I under-anticipated uh, the significance of that security agreement and the huge strategic success that that was for both the United States and Iraq. And I do want to then talk a little bit about uh, four key strategic issues. And if you can see the slide, these four issues are, as we thought about it and as we saw, thought about what constitutes a successful Iraq, we really framed it in for these four strategic issues. And the first one was when we leave, when the, uh, the last American forces leave at the end of 2011. Can the Iraqi security forces keep a lid on the insurgency? Or will that insurgency evolve into uh, the levels of violence that we saw back in 2006 and 2007? And the second question was, once the United States leaves and creates this big sucking vacuum out of there, and there's going to be a desire from other neighboring countries to fill that vacuum, can Iraq stand up and uh, counter some of the maligned and non-maligned interests from some of their neighboring countries, Iran, Syria, and even Turkey? and can they develop the right relationship with them. In my area was Kurdistan, as I mentioned, the third strategic question is, can Iraq resolve its ethnic differences peacefully, principally the Kurd Arab issue, or will that resolution effort resolve into lethal conflict? And I want to talk a lot about Kurdistan and, and some of those sort of issues. And I remember I was standing next to the governor of Nineveh uh, Governor Afil Najafi and about in the Najafi ran for government in the Al Hubda party, and it was primarily f again with an anti Kurd and an anti coalition force agenda. And he has a lot of times a former, a lot of ties to some of the former regimes. And uh, as we, as he seated his government, as we developed a relationship, he sat and talked to me one time. He said, You know, we've been thinking about the relationship the future relationship that the United States is going to have with Iraq. We wonder if that relationship after you leave is going to be a relationship like you have with Syria, or is that relationship going to be like a relationship that you have with Jordan or with the Emirates? Because that's very important to us. So the question is when the last American leaves in the end of 2011, what is going to be the strategic relationship with Iraq? And given the fact of the tremendous strategic importance of Iraq, not only for its, all, its, its natural resources, where it's positioned uh, centrally in the Middle East, but not only that, but the fact that it's, it potentially could be on the western flank of a potentially nuclear-armed Iran, our relationship is significant. We just had our redeployment ceremony in uh, in, in uh, middle of November, right before Thanksgiving, and we invited the families of our fallen soldiers and one of the fathers went up to one of our battalion commanders and asked him, he says, was my son's sacrifice worth it? And, you know, as all of us as commanders, as we are in the middle of that, we all uh, have soldiers that are killed or injured. Uh, but you wonder, is their sacrifice worth it? And I think this strategic question answers it, because will that sacrifice be worth it? It will be measured on the strategic relationship that we have uh, with Iraq and January 1st on 2012. So this is, these are some of the things I want to talk to you um, as we go along. Uh, I want to be mindful of the time, really, because I, I do want to um, make sure that we have at least a good uh, 45 minutes for some of the questions uh, that, that I know that you have. Um, okay, let me go, Chris, to slide four, if I could. Uh, because what I, what I want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit about the operational environment in Iraq for, for when we left it in, two, in November of 2009. And what you see up there and I, again, I apologize for those of you who have trouble seeing this, but this is uh, Multinational Division North. These are the four Arab provinces, Diyala, Saladin, Nineveh Province, and Kirkuk Province, and the three Kurdish provinces up here. This one right here is the Hook. This is Air, actually Air Beal goes up in this area, and this is Salamania. Uh, Baghdad sits right over here. So we are at the eastern flank of Baghdad between, that sits right there with Diyala Province, from Iran to, uh, uh, between Iran and Baghdad. Uh, this is the Syrian border, this is the Turkish border, and this is the Iranian border over here. Inside this block are some of the points I want to make and I want to talk about with each one of the, uh, which one of the provinces. And then of a province, we have where the insurgency had its heart. And I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of the insurgency and what some of the changes that are actually taking place. But but when, because of the successful surge in Baghdad and Al-Qaeda 
slash Islamic State of Iraq, uh, they found that their leadership had evolved and, and migrated to Mosul. That was the center for their leadership. That was the center where they were conducting their recruiting. It's where, the, it's where they still had safe haven inside the city, and it's also where they were, create, they were generating a lot of their finance from. Uh, Mosul had always been an economy of force effort. When we first got up there, General Odierno said, I want you to do a good assessment of Mosul. And within 30 days after we took over, we started what we call the mini surge of Mosul. And we tried to bring the equivalent troop levels into Mosul that you, you had seen uh, back in 2006 and 2007 in Baghdad. Um, and we, actually, I could talk about that we had some, some good successes. Nineveh province is also the province so that you see a lot of Kurd Arab issues because when the JP was the governor, as I said, and ran on an anti-Kurd uh, anti platform, even though the Kurds uh, had, uh, came in second place in the voting, he would not allow the Kurds to have any of the positions in there. So the Kurdish villages with the Nineveh seceded and they wanted to leave uh, the Nineveh province. So we had this big, huge tension between Kurds and Arabs that was actually playing out in that particular province. Nineveh province, uh, culturally has got a huge cultural background and, um, and has f historically for thousands of years uh, is very tremendous, got a great history, great culture. On the western flank of, cult of uh, Nineveh province of Syria, and you're very familiar with the foreign fighter uh, effort that was continuing and, con and still to this day continues to come through Syria into Nineveh province. And then, um, um, so, so Nineveh has got a whole host of particular issues. Saladin province, just moving south, is a Sunni-dominated province with has got a lot of former regimes. It's where, it's where Saddam is from originally. It's his hometown in Tikrit. Uh, but, but the government that ended up in uh, Saladin province was all about governing, and they wanted to get on with governing. We found that we found, we found some of the greatest successes in governing, and as a result, we found some of the uh, greatest success in security and in, in economic development in Saladin province, and was, uh, we were very encouraged by that. Um, they were very concerned, you know, it, you've heard the adage that the Shias uh, fear uh, the past, the Sunnis fear the future, and the Kurds fear both, but the Sunnis in Saladin province certainly were very cautious about uh, the Shia government and what, what kind of representation they were going to have in that particular government. Um, but, uh, and also in Saladin province, we had uh, Samra, and Samra was where you had that, the Shia mosque, the Golden Mosque, where in February 2006, when it was exploded by Zarqawi, in order to incite some of the, some of the violence that took place, um, you know that uh, that was, it's a very important area. So the resolution and the security that was necessary to be created in Samra was, uh, was one of our points of, of interest. Kirkuk province is a very interesting province because Kirkuk is really at the heart of the Kurd Arab issues because of the resolution of Kirkuk City, whether it's going to be part of Kurdistan or whether Kirkuk City was going to be part of the Arab area. So that was really at the heart of it. Uh, we, we didn't realize um, when we first got there the depth of passion between the Kurd Arab and that whole, air, and that whole situation. And as the Iraqi security forces built up their capacity one of the last divisions to be created was the 12th Iraqi Army Division, and it stood up in November of, of uh, 2008, commanded by General Amir. Uh, General Amir is uh, Arab, and he's got a uh, reputation that is much feared by the Kurds because of what they claim his former associations with uh, Saddam and some of the Anfal campaign uh, operations. So they claim. Uh, so as he formed up the, his division, he was given the responsibility to secure some of the key installations around Kirkuk, which include the oil fields. And if you know where the oil fields are, they're right on the border between the disputed areas of Kurdistan and, and the rest of, of Arab Kirkuk. And as a result, uh, he started putting people in areas where Kurds were kind of concerned and, and, and they were kind of north of that green line. And next thing you know, that the generals from Peshmerga and the generals from, our, from uh, uh, the Iraqi army were facing off with each other, pointing fingers in each other's chest. I got this frantic call to run up there, and all of a sudden I found myself smack in the middle of uh, you know, two generals that were you know, pointing at each other, and I'm trying to separate them and try to bring some calm to the situation. So we, we quickly understood the depth of passion that was in that particular area. Uh, and also in southern Kirkuk, province, that's where you have pretty much some Arab tribes uh, that are very much affiliated with Al-Qaeda in the Al-Qaeda insurgency. 
in and around the city of Hawija, so we find some of the support zones in Kirkuk that support some of the, in, the existing uh, uh, insurgent movements. Diala Province is an interesting province. Diala Province is the province that is uh, uh, just on the eastern flank of the Tigris River. It also borders Iran, and it also has about 20% uh, of Diala Province is, um, is uh, Kurdish. So you have the Kurd Arab issue. The ethnic composition of Diyala province is 20% Sunni, 20% Shia, uh, I'm sorry, 40% Sunni, 40% Shia, and 20% Kurd. So you have this ethnical balance between Sunni and Shia, so you see a lot of sectarian issues that are playing out there. There are a lot of what we call external influencers in, in Diyala province, uh, one of which is Iran because uh, Iran, if you look at where the, the country of Iran is with regard to Baghdad, Diyala province is the closest distance between the two points. Uh, so there is a lot of traffic and a lot of Iranian pilgrimage that actually comes through uh, Diyala province. So there's a lot of interest. Almost 100% of the electricity in Diyala province is generated from uh, on the other side of the border in Iran. Um, from a uh, Shia perspective, Diyala province is the home of Zarqawi. And when Zarqawi's ideology, when he was advocating his ideology, uh, Diyala province was going to be the center of his caliphate. That's where Zarqawi was killed. He was killed in Diyala province. So if I was a Shia, a Shia who had feared the past, I would very much fear uh, the Sunni insurgency and even the remnants of that insurgency that are still in place in Diyala province. Um, when we had the elections in January, they actually elected a Sunni government. And we, re we quickly found that the central government, the Shia Maliki central government, was very concerned about the Sunni government that was sitting off their eastern, Baghdad's eastern flank there in their support areas. Uh, so we found all of a sudden that uh, some of the warrants of arrest against some of the council members all of a sudden started percolating to the top and we found some of, some, some of these uh, provincial council members and even one of the deputy governors now all of a sudden was under arrest, was, so there was a warrant out for their arrest. So they scattered and we realized that the government itself was at this particular position not even being able to function because you know the, the provincial council had scattered and the deputy government, governor had scattered. So we found some sort of interference in, in trying to get some of the arrests made by the central government uh, in the affairs of the provincial government. So Diallo is a very interesting place, although the attack levels in Diallo have dropped significantly. So that was our operating environment uh, that we went through. Okay, what, what I'd like to do now is, is talk to you a little bit about how we see some of the uh, enemy evolving a little bit. And if I can go to the next slide. Um, in, the, in our area in MND North, we pretty much still had a Sunni insurgency of Al-Qaeda, and they called themselves Islamic State of Iraq, which was the Iraqi face that they put on Al-Qaeda. Uh, so like I said, they were on Mosul and, and centered in that area, but they had conducted operations. What we found is they're becoming more cellular. And as a result of becoming more cellular, they're moving to areas where they feel that they have freedom of movement, and then they're conducting high-profile attacks. Their main purpose in the, conducting the high-profile attacks is to discredit the Iraqi government and also to discredit the Iraqi security forces. The attacks that we saw in Baghdad just the other day were exactly for that purpose, because they go right in the heart of Baghdad and have a m multiple series of attacks that can simultaneously go off, and it really is intended to show the limitations of the security forces to prevent them from coming in. Um, they also are taking advantage of the less or less security that exists in the disputed areas between that disputed area between Kurdistan and the Arab provinces. So they'll go into some of those disputed areas, particularly where you find some of the minority towns and villages the Shabaks and the Kurdish and the Christian and the Yazidis villages that are in that area. And they'll take a dump truck or some vehicle that's just packed with uh, homemade explosives or other type of detonation device and they'll detonate the thing and, and their intent is to you know, kill as many people and to achieve as much destruction as possible. And again, its purpose is to discredit the Iraqi security forces. And it was amazing how it worked and it was amazing to see the reaction of the provincial governors when those attacks occurred, blaming the Kurds, and then the Kurds blaming the other side, and, 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 the, and the distrust that it created among the people. So it was having that sort of effect. We found that some of these 
shells started moving around even out of Nineveh province and moving to other areas. We, right before I left, we captured a couple in Saladin province, and they said that things were getting pretty tight in Nineveh province and Mosul, so we came down here to Saladin where we thought we had greater freedom of movement uh, and, and that sort of thing. So we're finding them to be more cellular. We also have this thing called uh, Jesh Riyadh Tariq Nashkabani and the Nashkabani movement. The Nashkabani movement is a, um, is a former regimist movement headed up by Al-Dari, Al Al uh, Al who is one of the key leaders of the Saddam regime who is in residence in Syria. It comes back forth and tries to get this thing generated. A grassroots sort of uh, organization that has the military rank and file. Um, and this is one of the ideology, this is one of the organizations that I think in the future ha has the capacity to really, if it builds up, the, if it builds its capacity, um, can become one of the significant threats to the uh, government of Iraq. Um, at one particular point, I thought that, you know, the, the most significant threat from an uncertain standpoint to the future government of Iraq was Nashkabani and Nashkabani movement in the event it would take off and start building some popular support. But as I look at Al-Qaeda and their capacity in this new cellular evolution that they're going through to go after high-profile attacks, um, I would also argue that is also remains a significant threat. We found that the targeting of uh, these insurgent movements was moving from targeting coalition force and U.S. forces and Iraqi security forces uh, to targeting the minority civilian populations. And we found out that their financing and, and to generate their funds was evolving from uh, extortion of big businesses, you know, like the Beji oil refinery, to beginning to extort smaller businesses and contracts and things of that sort. We also found that the enemy was resilient and they had the capacity to regenerate themselves. Uh, we would go and conduct counter-terrorist operations in a counterinsurgency strategy and we would just decapitate some of these networks that were out there. And then all of a sudden, like 30, 45, 60 days later, they would, they would reappear. So they have a resilience and, and ability to regenerate themselves. They also have, are very adaptive tactically. As, a, as, a, as we come up with new technology, they'll come up with a technology that will counter that and uh, then forces us to go back in and, and reassess it. Okay, what I'd like to do now is with that framework, I'd like to talk, if I could, a little bit about the security agreement uh, because as I had mentioned in my introductory comments, this security agreement what really was a, um, a huge, in my opinion, of a strategic success, not only to the United States, but also to the government of Iraq. Um, the security agreement went into effect in one January. We got there in November, and they were still figuring out what the security agreement should look like. And then when it went into effect, this most significant change that occurred to us as tactical forces on the ground is that we could not, no longer conduct unilateral operations. We can do a unilateral movement or something like that, but if we were going to conduct an operation, we had to work with Iraqis. If we had to be partnered with Iraqis, which really was good, is because it forced us to seek out our, our Iraqi partners and it forced us to partner with them. And through that partnering effort um, and working with them, it, it helped us to, through that effort, build their capacity and to build their capabilities. And, and I saw that as good. When I told you about the efforts that we had in Mosul and that mini surge that we had done in Mosul, you know, if it was in the old, prior to the security agreement, prior to 1 January, we would have just developed the plan and then executed the plan. But after 1 January, it changed a little bit. Now, in order to execute the plan, we told the Iraqi divisions, hey, this is what we need to do because we have to be partnering with you. And they said, well, before I'm going to do that with you, I got to get permission from the ground force commander. So next thing we took a trip down to Baghdad and met with the ground force commander and he said, well, I got to get permission from the Minister of Defense. And then we had to sit down with the Minister of Defense and explain it all and lay it all out to him. And he said, well, this is, this is big enough that the Prime Minister's got to approve it. So finally we got the Prime Minister to, to okay this sort of thing. And once we got that level of permission, it matriculated back down and we started conducting the operations. So an operation we thought was going to start in early January, you know, started almost a month later because we had a, it was, but it was good because it forced us to really get together and start working with our partners. And we found later how important that partnership was. 30 January was, inter I mean, 30 June was interesting. 30 June is the out of the cities. 
If you were back here and you saw some of the press coverage of Out of the Cities, you probably saw Iraqis in the streets dancing, celebrating. And as we were sitting there looking at the celebration that was going on for being out of the cities, we frankly all started wondering who are they celebrating victory over? Is it a victory over the United States that we're finally leaving the cities or what's the celebration? And then on uh, 1 July, the day after 30 June, we, start, we had made arrangements of what conditions we can go into the cities with, and that was under an advise and assist capacity. So as we started to partner up with Iraqis and to go with our MRAPs with them, they said, no, we don't want, that's okay, we're gonna, we don't need you to advise and assist us. We'd rather you not come out here with, our, with your MRAPs. And then we would go to uh, do our police training at the police stations, and they said, no, we would rather not have the, have the training at the police stations. And then as we started talking to them to understand why they were concerned about us being with them in the cities like that, we came to realize that it was not so much that they didn't want the training, they very much wanted the training. It's not so much they didn't want the advice, they very much valued the advice. But they just didn't want, they no longer wanted to be seen with the MRAP, with the American MRAP. And because when you take an MRAP and put an MRAP downtown Mosul, the Iraqi people see that as the Americans providing security and the Americans are in charge and as a result the Iraqis are subordinate to the Americans. When you remove the Americans from being in the city anymore, the Iraqi security forces are in charge. And the Iraqi security forces very much embraced and they valued the fact that they were now in charge of the security of the Iraqi people, which is exactly the army that we wanted to create. It was the, the, exactly the duty concept that we were creating in the Iraqi security forces. And we thought the celebration was that the United States had left. The celebration was really the fact that they were celebrating their sovereignty and they were celebrating the fact that uh, they were now in charge of securing the Iraqi people and they embraced that mission. I was very concerned about it as a tactical commander because we, had con we were in, in about month five of this mini surge of Mosul and, if you, and we were pretty steady on attack levels. We were just starting to see some significant movement and then all of a sudden we had to be out of the cities and I was explaining to General Odierno and to the Iraqi leader, military leadership, this is too early. The security agreement allowed for exceptions and we were hoping that the Prime Minister would make that exception, but he elected not to. So from a tactical perspective, I thought that that was not the right decision and I realized I, I was wrong. Thanks to General Odierno and his ability to really think strategically and his, in his discussions with uh, Prime Minister Maliki, he realized how important it was to to the Iraqis and the Iraqi leadership and the Iraqi people that the United States abide by that security agreement. And from a strategic standpoint, it was more important to prove and to illustrate that the United States was committed to the security agreement and how important that was to the Iraqi people. To illustrate the point, about a month later, I was at a press conference with the governor of Nineveh. Remind you, this is the governor who had uh, ran for office on an anti-Kurd and anti-coalition force agenda and we're at a press conference and he's saying this is my uh, United States military partner and we used to see him as the army of occupation. Now we see him as the army that's going to rebuild our country and that's going to rebuild our province. And how he, va and how he, tr how he not went from an anti-coalition force agenda to embracing what we were doing in the reconstruction of his province and that, that strategic message that was being passed to the Iraqi people. It was a strategic success because the Iraqi people realized that the Americans were true to their word. And that was very important. And it was a strategic success because other countries that had doubted whether or not we were gonna comply with the timeline of the security agreement realized that we were true to our word, Western Europe and countries like that. So even though I was concerned about the tactical implications, the strategic implications were, were, were huge. We also realized after, after 30 June, because, they, because the Iraqi security forces had embraced this mission so much, that our relationship with them had changed. Because we, were, we had changed from a, working with Iraqis from a lethal standpoint, now to work with Iraqis in a train and assist standpoint. And this is critically important. In order, let me illustrate it this way, in order to get effects on the battlefield as a military commander before 1 January, I would, con I would determine what effects were necessary 
develop an operation and then go execute the operation, and sometimes we drag Iraqi security forces with us. After 1 January, we determined what the mission was. We got the Iraqis to agree with us, and we did it together, but, uh, but us and the lead. After 30 June, however, the Iraqis were in charge of their security. And all we were doing is advising the system, not even doing combat operations in the city. So in order to get effects on the battlefield post 30 June, this is how complicated it was for us, for us as commanders, all the way down to that platoon leader and company commander. You had to first develop a relationship so that you could enter into a partnership. And what you had to do is you had to bring to that relationship something they considered that was value added. And once you had the partnership, you could enter into an, a dialogue that would suggest what effects were necessary. And when you had that dialogue and they trusted you, then they listened to you. Well, they always listened to you, but, but they really would listen and value your contributions and your mentoring once you had that relationship. And then once through that mentoring you determined what the necessary mission needed to be, then they agreed to go ahead and do it and they conducted and achieved effects. Before 1 January, we conducted the operation, we achieved effects. And now in order to achieve effects, they had to conduct the operation, but it was a result of a discussion we had with them, which was a result of a partnership, which was a result of a relationship. And that's, and I'll tell you what, the work that these young lieutenants and young captains were doing in order to develop those relationships was, uh, was really magnificent. And they, were, they just really did a tremendous job. And, uh, but, it, but it, it was some good work. Okay, what I'd like to do now is, um, I wanna skip all the way over to my commander's assessment. And that is slide 12 if I could. Um, if I can go to sli slide 11 real quick. I just wanna show you how our campaign plan evolved a little bit. Um, this was uh, before 30 June and this is after 30 June. If you look at this, this is the enemy, an enemy that you first have to um, uh, isolate and defeat in order, to, uh, in, in order to defeat them. And you would do that by security operations and direct action. And you also do it by shaping the environment, counterinsurgency doctrine. And our line of effort was a security line of effort, which was our lethal line of effort. And we also had uh, supporting Iraqi security force development and governance and economics. But this evolved because as we started working with our, our Iraqi security partners, and we no longer did combat operations, we had to take out the security uh, line of effort. So our main effort line of effort was supporting Iraqi security forces. And we continued to have a governance and an econ economic line of effort in order to shape the environment. And that's how that evolved. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> um, there are a lot on this slide, but this is what I have my commander's assessment here. And I, and I really I have my commander's assessment based on the three line of efforts that we finished with, support to Iraqi security forces, economic, and government. And I would say that the Iraqis, the Iraqis believe they have the security under control but they also recognize that there is a requirement for other enablers that we provide. Some of those enablers are route clearance capabilities, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, um, uh, thing, things of that sort. Um, we feel that as we look at their capacity and capability, they have come a long way on their capacity and capability, but what's really important at this point is their intelligence and their ability to take intelligence, to fuse it, to not categorize it and to, and to share it across uh, all of their organizations. So intelligence is important as well. Um, we put ourselves in the best position to assist them and to partner with them in maintaining their situation awareness. <clears throat> uh, and we also believe from a security standpoint, two important points. One is that the Kurd Arab issue that I talked about still remains the most dangerous course of action for their security. And the most, in my opinion, the most important thing that must be fixed in the security is the rule of law and handling terrorist cases. Because regardless of the capacity of the Iraqi security forces, we found that the insurgents that were being rolled up after 1 January, because we no longer, the United States can hold an insurgent after 1 January and put them in Bukha and places like that. We had to turn them over to the Iraqi legal system. And we found that we were arresting insurgents up to six to eight times. And there was a very, and there was a, a very well-known plan on how the insurgents would bribe certain people 
in the Iraqi judicial process in order to get themselves back on the street again. Uh, and um, rule of law as a whole, particularly administrative rule of law in Iraq was progressing well. Rule of law in handling terrorist cases uh, was uh, something that we were very concerned about. The chief judge in Diallo, to illustrate this, uh, they finally got a judge who agreed to be the chief judge. Uh, he was one year from his retirement and his, his, his stated objective was, I hope I can live for a year so that I can retire. He, kept, he lived in his office and wouldn't leave his office. He had a, his own bodyguards that he particularly hired. He placed them outside his office. They guarded him. They put T walls around the outside of his office so a car wouldn't drive up to it and blow up, in, in, you know, blow up next to him. And um, the, the, the guards themselves were also guards that, um, that you know, tasted his food and went out and got his food, and they were like cupbearers to make sure that they weren't given, he wasn't getting poisoned food. And his stated objective, like I said, was to live for one year so he can retire. He's from a totally different province and has his own security for his family down there. So, so that was, uh, you know, some of the significance that we had. Okay, um, uh, so that was, uh, you know, from a, from a security standpoint, uh, the security of the uh, rule of law was what we consider most significant. Um, I got a note here that says I need to kind of accelerate a little bit. I do want to go over a couple of these uh, strategic issues, and I'm going to open it to uh, questions and answers. So, and I could talk in the Q&A a little bit more about my assessment from the economic standpoint and also from uh, the governance standpoint. Let me go real quick to that, to the first question, to the next slide, which is that right there. Will the Iraqi security forces have the capacity and capability to deny violent extremists safe haven and to prevent its reemergence? In other words, when we, the United States, leave at the end of 2011, will the Iraqi security forces keep a lid on the uncertainty so that it doesn't re re evolve into 2006-7 uh, levels of violence? And we think it is. We think the Iraqi security forces have that capacity and capability, but they're uh, we assess that there is a need for, uh, to refine their command and control and their intelligence. Uh, they have to learn how to hold security gains. One area we think that needs a lot of work is the Iraqi police. And um, the, the Iraqi police, the, the concept is that the Iraqi army will move out of the cities and secure the support zones all the way out to the borders. And just like in all, every other democratic nation, your population centers, which are the area where the people live, where the majority of people need to be protected, that will be the responsibility of the police, where the police will have police primacy. A lot of the cities, the police are very effective and efficient. Kirkuk is an example. But there are some cities that the police have a long way to go to build not only their capacity but also their capabilities, and Mosul is an example with that. We also feel the border police are an area that needs, needs a significant amount of work. Um, let me go all the way to the second one, which is uh, slide number 19. And that was, will the government of Iraq have the capacity to counter malign external influences? Um, this is pretty interesting because there's a lot of complications up in the north because on the Syrian border, you have the foreign fighter flow that still comes through Syria. And we spent a lot of energy and put, a, put some significant intelligence capacities and capabilities in place to be able to identify, uh, because if you're going to interdict border crossings, illegal border crossings, you have to look on the other side of the border, along the border, and inside sector, inside the Nineveh province. So we put the intelligence network in place to, to accomplish that. Uh, and then you have to have the capacity to be able to, when the crossing occurs, to find it, and then to be able to fix it so that they don't scatter off into the desert and then to you know, apprehend them, uh, kill, capture. So we had to put the security force to do that. And then, not only did we have our security force that did it, we, had, we created the work with the Iraqis for the Iraqi security force to do it, which was very good. Uh, a lot of, I could talk a lot about what's going on in, with the PKK and the PJAC in Kirkuk province, up in Kurdistan. But a lot of great things, a lot of good things are happening with the PKK up in Kurdistan, and, and a lot of progress with Turkey. Uh, the, uh, the PJAC, which is the PKK equivalent uh, in Salamania that goes cross-border into uh, Iran is something different, though. And Iran responds with uh, indiscriminate indirect fire, and they do that very often, and they will put the indirect fire, indiscriminate indirect fire, right into Iraqi cities. 
but it is in response to some of the operations of the PJAC that go off into Iran. Uh, but that still remains a problem, and as a result of the indiscriminate indirect fire, it creates uh, refugee camps in Salamania, uh, and the UN is doing a good job working with those. But we still have those issues. And then in Diyala province, you have the whole issue of what maligned and what non-maligned interests are coming across to affect not only Diyala province, but also uh, bringing in lethal uh, uh, activity uh, from Iran into Iraq in order to attack not only um, Americans' <coughs> coalition forces, but also Iraqis. And so we see some of that as well. So there's got to be a capability to, to deal with that. Um, let me go to the, th the third question, if I could, and this is the current Arab issue, and we could spend all day talking about that one, and that is uh, slide 24, yeah. I gave you uh, that scene setter about uh, General Amir when he took command and, and, and put some forces all the way around uh, Kirkuk City, around the oil fields, and the reaction that had from Kurdistan. And that was only one of a number of uh, cases that we felt that there, there were actually eight in all, particularly in those three uh, northern provinces, and where that borderline was going to be drawn. And uh, the Constitution had Article 140, which was a procedure and a timeline to resolve it. Well, that procedure did not happen as uh, the Constitution laid out, and certainly we've already passed the timeline. But the fact remains we still have this huge problem of the resolution of Article 140. Um, we found that the Kurds are, are very eager to get this resolved. We found that the Kurds were very eager to work with the Americans to get it resolved, and that the Americans were, were trusted by the Kurds, and they realized, and they told us very often, that it must be resolved before we leave, because they thought that after we left, it would not be able to be resolved. Um, certainly, the Maliki government was not in a position to resolve it before the elections, simply because the Maliki government does not want to be seen to be entering into negotiations with the Kurds, uh, that would not be, be viewed as popular from uh, the rest of Iraq uh, before the elections. But they do realize that it's something that has to get uh, resolved. Uh, so as uh, the elections proceed, we realize that it's not going to get resolved until after the elections. What we did at our level in order to try to mitigate some of the hot tempers that you found on the ground is we had this very significant effort to bring both the, the, Kurd, the Kurds, the Peshmerga and the Kurdish leadership together with the Arabs and the Garmian police with the Iraqi police. And we built security infrastructures, security meetings, security apparatus, command posts that we had where we put them together in, in joint configurations. And we actually had some joint checkpoints periodically and things of that sort. And we found that through those discussions and dialogue, we built transparency, it built a relationship, and as a result, at the tactical level, we were starting to build trust and confidence. And that was very important. Uh, but we also realized that, one good example, one of these Peshmerga generals who we felt had a good relationship with his Iraqi counterpart, just flat told me, he says, if one of, one of the Arabs cross this line right here, I will go to my death on defending this and preventing him from crossing. And he said, why? He, and his answer is, I will, not be go, I will not be known in Kurdish history as being the Kurd to allow a compromise of my territory to, to the Arab. So the passion behind the depth of that understanding is something that is, is a point that I really want to make. Um, so therefore, even though we built trust and confidence with some transparency, we were still not able to get this issue resolved. So where does the issue get resolved at? And the issue clearly has, has something that has to get resolved between Baghdad and Erbil. So if it's not going to be resolved between President Bersani and Prime Minister Maliki, it is something, if it's going to be resolved while the United States is still there, that's got to be one of the key agenda items post-2010 uh, elections, the parliamentary elections. And the new Iraqi government is going to have to do it. Can Iraq, does Iraq have the capacity to resolve their ethnic differences? The answer is yes. but. They must have the will at the senior levels of leadership to resolve it. And, and that's is something that must take place. <coughs> okay, last is, the, uh, is number, f number four. What's the strategic partnership between the United States and Iraq on January 1st, 2012? Well, as you know, all the military will leave. And, uh, and I think that's important. One other point to illustrate this 
I remember another governor standing, I stand next to him, he said, you know, I'm comfortable, I'm not comfortable standing in public next to you as a military guy because Iraqis see you as the occupier. I said, I understand that. And the same governor would take the provincial council chief and he would seek opportunities to stand next to him in public. He would create a public event and be standing next to the PRT chief because the Iraqis viewed the PRT chiefs as a start State Department representative. And since he was a State Department representative, you know, it was a degree of status. So, so they valued the, the diplomatic relationship with the United States. They understood the importance of the military presence, but they knew that was leaving and that was important to them. But there was, they valued very much the diplomatic relationship. So uh, that kind of may help us to understand that post-2011, how important it was to have a strong diplomatic relationship with, uh, with Iraq. And in order to have that strong diplomatic relationship in January 1st, 2012, based on Iraqi culture, it's something that's got to be developed in the relationships that are made today. Because you just can't have that relationship on January 1st. It's, it's a relationship that develops. After we were kicked out of the cities, no, I don't want to say kicked out, after we left the cities in accordance with the security agreement <laughs> on, on 30 June, we realized that we had to develop relationships in some cases. And, um, and we had to bring things that, to this relationship that they considered that were value added. And sometimes when our units transitioned and a new unit came in, we found that the Iraqis were very cold to the new unit. And we didn't understand why. And the answer was because the new unit had to earn their trust. Because in that relationship, it's something you earn. And they had to earn that trust and they had to earn their confidence. But once you earned it and you had a good relationship, it was very strong. They considered you a brother. Uh, so uh, that relationship in January 1st, 2012 is diplomatic. It's going to be um, economic. It's going to be based on reconstruction efforts, that, which is going to be a key component of that. And it's something that's built today. Uh, and that's very important. So in light of that, that really makes the case of how important our PRTs in Iraq are right now. And the civilian capacity effort in Iraq uh, at this particular point, because of the, of the work that's being done now and the relationships that are being built and the confidence that Iraq is, uh, is developing with Americans, primarily from a diplomatic standpoint uh, today, so that in 2012 we can maintain the strong, that strong relationship. Okay, and I'll go to the very last slide. <coughs> Um, overall assessment of strategic issues, the one before that. And this is kind of a summary slide, and, and really, um, we, s we feel that we provide Iraqis in MD North with the security and breathing room to successfully contribute to their future. We think the Iraqi security forces are on track, to developing capacity and capability. There are some areas uh, that they need to work on, uh, police uh, and also uh, intelligence and rule of law. Well, we believe the governor of Iraq has the capacity to counter external line influences. We feel that the, ex the Iraqi leadership elected in 2010 must be able to resolve ethnic differences. The, because the question is, if they don't, then how will they be resolved? And then the last one is that the strategic partnership between the United States and Iraq on January 1st is critical, and we are developing it today through relationships that we're building from a diplomatic and a reconstruction, economic and reconstruction standpoint. Okay, I think I talked long enough. John Kaslan, that was a <laughs> superb description of uh, what you did during your, your time there. Um, what we'll do now is take questions uh, from you. We're very glad you're here. Um, we have two mics, a mic on either side here. So if you'd like to ask John Kaslan a question, please make your way to the mics. Uh, we will alternate. Um, while you're doing this, John Kasten, let me just ask you the first one while people are, are coming forward. Um, I was struck, and I'm sure you were, by the question from the father to you, one of the battalion commanders, uh, about his son's uh, sacrifice. Um, and you've answered those four strategic questions, kind of yes, if. Um, um, from an overall standpoint then, um, we have, you have given, and, and others coming before you and are there now, have given the possibility to the Iraqis to develop something that could be strategic for them uh, and strategic for us. Um, how confident are you that you can say yes to that, uh, to that father? Well, uh, 
I'm feeling that everything's going in the right direction, but we're not there yet. So the yes if is that there still is work to be done. Um, and that work is in, in uh, you know, if you look at that, as I frame that last question is, yes, if we have a strong diplomatic relationship <clears throat> that is defined through economic development that is really through the impetus of reconstruction, uh, which really begs for this is a time to not abandon civilian capacity in Iraq. This is a time where you, we really have, we are at, we have a tremendous opportunity to, pr to really cement this relationship to, of the Iraqi people, the Iraqi political leadership, and the security leadership. Not only that, but when we, Solid End Province is a great example of once you had the political leadership engaged, and it really, I mean, it really dropped down the, the attack levels in Solid End Province. It really built up the, Solid End Province had the highest economic development in, of all the provinces that we saw. Direct correlation between uh, govern, governments that are governing and, um, and the uh, security and the uh, economic development. Uh, so, so when we continue to provide that necessary economic development, it strengthens the governments and which has an impact on the security as well. 80% uh, of the insurgents that are operating out there, in my opinion, are operating for economic purposes only. $50 to throw a hand grenade. And they'll throw a hand grenade for Nashkabani as quickly as they'll throw a hand grenade for Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. They don't have an ideological uh, 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 loyalty. But if you can change the economic incentive of $50 for throwing a hand grenade to getting a job, that a job's out there and build up the economy so that there's an economy that gives these kids uh, a hope and a future, uh, you have uh, eliminated the foot soldiers of that ne of that network, <coughs> which is something I think is critical. Very good. If I can get you to <coughs> identify yourselves and your organizations um, and uh, keep your uh, questions focused, and we'll start right here, and then we'll go over here. Yeah, hi. My, uh, <coughs> my name is. Can you uh, hear? Yes. Yeah. My name is Mike Hardeman. and I served in Iraq in uh, civilian capacities with Patricia Berg Stresser, who's going to ask the next question. <laughs> but. Um, Regarding the uh, the border between uh, Iran and the uh, 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 Diyala, uh, Salah uh, Diyala and um, the it's Kurdish uh, governorates, you mentioned the Milan influences, but there's also some positive influences, such as the supply of electricity and their revenue from uh, religious pilgrimages. What other uh, positive influences are there uh, that coming in from Iran in terms of the economics through the uh, border control points of the ports of entry from Iran into the Kurdish areas and into the uh, mixed areas in Diyala? Well, I, I would just think economically. I mean, they have a significant number of pilgrims that come through there. So they, they come through the port of entry, travel through Bakuba, then go into uh, Baghdad. A lot of them go up to the uh, the Golden Shrine and some of the ones, some of the other uh, pilgrimage sites that are in Iraq. So the, the so the pilgriming itself brings a lot of economic benefit to uh, to Iraq. Um, and then they, like you had mentioned, the electricity. And particularly as Iraq still struggles to provide electricity to its own people, reliable electricity on a 24-hour basis, uh, Diyala is the one province that there are no issues because they do have reliable electricity, but it comes from Iran. But, but what that does is that, that forms, that, that gives Iran the capability to be of influence into the affairs, into the internal affairs of Iraq. So. You can have economic you can have e economic influence. The question I would ask, though, is how much of the economic influence in support of the reconstruction of Iraq a ends up leading to leading to uh, diplomatic influences. Um, an, an example is the MEK. You know, Maliki was under tremendous pressure by Iran on dealing with the MEK, and. I, I don't know for exactly sure how he responded to it. I didn't see what happened. The one time they went ahead and tried to move them, which caused the, the huge humanitarian situation that was there a few months ago. But, and he's made the decision to go ahead and act before the end of the month of December. Well, so we'll make sure to see how that's going to play out. But that is an example of, of Iran interf interfering into the affairs of the Maliki government on that one situation. There are other situations, but on the situation in the MEK. They Iran would make the case that they have the right to do that. Uh, but, you know, that's, it, the more that Iraq feels dependent upon Iran for a number of different elements of economic power or whatever, then the more influential Iran will be on the internal affairs of Iraq. So you, it's a balance. How do you balance, you know, the internal interests? I think that's a, a better way to frame it. 
Very good. Yes, ma'am. Please. Hi, Pat Bergstress here from the State Department. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask you about your reconstruction efforts. Uh, one of my big concerns is bandwidth at the universities because I'm involved with public diplomacy now. And um, evidently some CERP funds were being used to try to increase the bandwidth at universities and then suddenly it stopped. So my question to you is uh, the military in reconstruction and specifically in your area, um, were there any efforts made and um, will there be efforts made? Efforts for bandwidth? Bandwidth, increasing the bandwidth. I'm not, a f I'm not familiar with any of our CERP projects for bandwidth not in, in Amity North. Th was, was the one that you're talking about, was no, that in Amity North? No, Baghdad. It was Baghdad, but the question is, since education is one of the primary, um, I would say, positive non-political bridges that can be built, Yes. Um, for them to have access to U.S. universities and to classes or higher education, uh, they really need to have the bandwidth. And it was my understanding that the military was going to do that. So um, if you could check into it, I would I th be No, I think that's, uh, that's an excellent project. One of the thing, I'll tell you one of the things we did is we took all, we went to each one of the Iraqi universities and we solicited a, part, a United States university partner. And we were able, and, w and one of our efforts was to partner American universities with an Iraqi university. And the so University of South Carolina was very eager to work with the Crit University and they actually f flew a bunch of professors over. And they sat down and said, okay, what are all your requirements? And they realized that they're still operating out of 1970s textbooks. They didn't have any, uh, any accessibility to the web. And, and as I was talking to the South University of South Carolina, one of the things they said is that we need to develop a, a web capability for this college and we need to get their textbooks translated into the 21st century. And, and that's one of the couple of the projects that they took on. Uh, so I'm not sure it needs... That's another way to do it in the University of South Carolina. And then we were trying to get some of the other universities that they had agreed to partner with the Iraqi universities over, but, um, but that's another technique. And, and, and I know the embassy embraced our efforts to partner with the American universities. And that, and, and that might be another way to accomplish that. Yeah, well, you're, you're, well, bandwidth or at least accessibility to the web in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Over here, please. Um. Igor Istomin, uh, Nimo University, Moscow, and now visiting research at SAIS. Uh, thank you so much for your brilliant presentation. I want to just ask a question. Uh, with uh, some talks with some uh, military f f f uh, officials from American military, I uh, realized that uh, it was... Uh, improvements of security were mostly bottom-top approach coming fr from the village, fr on the village level, on the provincial level. But uh, what they sometimes said me that there was not enough civilian officials, State Department uh, officials on the ground. They were mostly in Baghdad. Uh, do you think this is a, a real problem and uh, how you try to, to solve this getting on the ground? Um, well, that's a great question. Uh, were there enough civilian personnel? Uh, well, let me, I could speak to the time I was there, and, and I'll tell you that the PR, most of our civilians that were working with us were really in the area of the PRTs. So those are the ones that worked the day-to-day -day operations with the local governments, you know, the provincial governments and the Qatas and the Mejias. The embassy had some, Ambassador Krzyzewski, for example, was our, the ambassador for the Northern Affairs, and he, came and helped us and did a lot of the work with the Kurds especially. So he was very helpful. But the day-to-day -day business was with the PRTs. Uh, the PRTs went out, embraced, you gotta understand the picture on the ground. They embraced the governments, okay, let me back up. We had the provincial government election in January and they were probably seated and started governing in March. The governments before them were from the 2005 election. And that's when the Sunnis didn't vote so in m &D North, where you had a big Sunni population, each one of the provincial governments, for the most part, was misrepresented and therefore not trusted. And then, then I would make the case, having seen both of them, that they were very ineffective. A good example of their ineffectiveness is they were only able to appropriate about less than 40% of their budget. And that's when the price of oil was high and there was a lot of money. And they couldn't even, they couldn't even spend the money that was coming to them, that was allocated to them in reconstruction. So the governments were not very functional. The Nineveh government, I would just say, was inept. There was no government. 
And <clears throat> so we now have new government. So the PRT is working with these governments. And they are really, the PRT is one deep in each one of the, each one of the offices. And they are really in the role of advisor and assist. So they're not, they don't have the capacity to make things happen. You know, to, hey, you need to have this project. Well, to, to advise them how to get a project and then to work that project all the way through to analysis and then to design and completion is, is two different things. So we had the civilian personnel to advise and assist, and the problem you had is you had an inept government that really was incapable of receiving that advice. And then you had the government, and then you had the military fighting the fight so the military was not doing the reconstruction effort. Okay, fast forward now to the new governments. TAC levels come down, and you still have PRTs that are out there. The PRTs now are advising a government that now is more competent and capable, that's listening to the advice of the PRT. They're organizing their government to be able to, to participate in the reconstruction. And the military, here's a key point, the military now is partnered to support the civilian reconstruction effort. So the capacity to make the plan happen really ends up being the military's responsibility. We were the ones that went out there and did all the work and the surveying and did the contracts, got the contract, and actually started the construction and, and completed the project, working with the Iraqi contractors. So the capacity to, pull, to make that happen, to actually see the reconstruction occur on the ground was with the military working in partnership with the civilians. So as we looked at the reconstruction project, what we left was something, I'm not, I think, a thing, a thing of beauty. We had provincial governments that were establishing priorities and the objectives. You had the strategy to accomplish those objectives written by the PRT in conjunction with the government. And then you had the means to accomplish it, the military, through primarily their SERP programs and other programs. And that was, very that was very important at the time because the, since the price of oil came down, uh, funding to the provincial governments just was cut deeply that while the time we were there. So, we, so they very much valued our contributions from a CERP perspective. And, then, and, then, and we just try to pile on at that particular point and try to get as much reconstruction happening because the, the, the direct correlation between the reconstruction and the effectiveness of the government and the security situation was, was huge. It was significant. Uh, so, so we realized how important it was to continue with, with that. So um, there's a lot of variables in that equation. You just can't say you had insufficient civilian effort. You, had, you, <laughs> you got capabilities of governments to receive advice, and then you have to have the, the depth of, of the capacity to make that advice actually occur on the ground. So I would argue that you really need a good civilian effort that is supported by you know, the capacity that the military brings. And then once the government, once the, the, that capacity is built through the Iraqi system, then that capacity will take, then, they'll, then you don't need the military to do it. You know, our civilian efforts continue to provide the advice necessary for the reconstruction. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. So, Hi, um, from Voice of America Kurdish Service. Uh, you talked about the, uh, if it's possible that the dispute uh, territories between the Kurds and Arab will be solved peacefully if the senior Iraqi leadership show will. Could you talk about that more? We saw the way they handled the, uh, election, uh, the election law. It took them uh, months to come up with an agreement <coughs> under a lot of pressure. We talked to people off the record. They would say that that happened under U.S. pressure on each uh, groups. Could you talk about the Iraqi le senior leadership maturity? Can they come up with balancing their own, their own group interest and the interest of Iraq? And uh, also, from your experience, how do you see the relationship between the civilians of these ethnic groups in the regions that you were there? Is it the same passion that you were talking about between the Peshmergas and the Iraqi police, or is it different? Um, okay, thanks. Well, I, you know, I, I look at the debate on the election law as a thing of that really good news. Even though they didn't resolve it in accordance with the timeline that they needed to, uh, you know, they, their constitution said they had to have elections by the end of January, so which means in order to get the elections <coughs> prepared, the IHEC had to have, the, the Iraqi High Commission for Elections had to have at least 60 days to pull all that together. So they needed to have a law by the end of I think October, well that got kept getting pushed to November, now to December, so now it ended up pushing the elections both. But the whole debate that actually took place was, was excellent then. 
you know. I mean, I know they couldn't come to an agreement, and they finally came to agreement at the, at the, la at the last minute. And even though the United States encouraged them and helped them, uh, you know, uh, uh, that, that's good. I mean, I, I think it's good. I mean, it's glad that they, they, that they value. That just shows us our partnership with them. But the whole dialogue that actually occurred in order to get their representation, the compromises that had to take place, that's no different than the health debate that's going on in Washington right now. You know, I mean, I think the health debate's more violent discussions than what's going to that, that what took place in Iraq. Um, but, but that, I think, is, is the democratic process at work, and they came up with a law that everybody agrees with. So, so that's good. That will build tremendous confidence in the democratic process for, uh, for that government, for the people of Iraq when they see that. Uh, so, so that's good. But what's key in all of that, though, is, okay, now you take that process, and what's it going to take to resolve Article 140? Well, you know, you had the will of the senior leadership of Iraq in place to resolve the election law. And you need the will of the, of the senior leadership of Iraq to resolve any of these <coughs> other major issues. If you don't have the will of the new government, of the new prime minister, then Article 140 won't get resolved. I, don't, I, don't, I would state it won't. And then if it doesn't get resolved, what are the consequences of, it, of it, what are the consequences of not getting resolved? And what are the consequences or what are the implications of the possibilities of getting resolved after the United States military leaves? So I think it's a question. The uh, civilians, well, first of all, the <coughs> Iraqi army and a Peshmerga, they would stand together and say, we are brothers. We are one Iraq. Um, uh, but when you, when, they when, you, when you force their ethnic differences and lay that on the table as a major issue, they will reside, they will fall in line with their ethnic backgrounds. Um, but they, they are, I give them a lot of credit to recognize that they are brothers. And, and in some of these meetings that we were at, there was, yelling and there was discussion and when the meeting was over they would hug and they would kiss and we, we Americans would look at it and say you know they were just yelling just a second ago and now they're they're hugging and, and giving you know a, a, a Iraqi kiss so I so I was very encouraged by that they recognize one Iraq and they recognize the importance of one Iraq and they and they all recognize the critical importance to get this resolved um, and you know I think it's it's the same debate that we have with diversity and what, what, are, what is the strength of diversity in the United States of America? When you look at the United States of America, I mean, the United States of America is probably one of the most diverse countries in the world, and if our background is the one that contributed to, the, to us being as diverse as we are, it's, and it's through this diversity that we get our strength. And, we, and as a result of understanding the strengths that every single ethnic person and every single person, regardless of what faith, can contribute to the good of the group, it makes us, as a result, stronger. And when we understand that, and we, and we experience how important that is, then we will embrace diversity. And see, that's where Iraq still needs to go. They, Iraq is very diverse, but they still need to go to the point where they want to embrace it. Iraq did that at one time. I remember the governor of Nineveh showed me a picture. And in that picture, this is back in the 1950s. And, he's, and in that picture was a, a Sabbath day, and it had every religion that was represented in Nineveh province. And there were like six or seven different, you know, you know the priest and, the, and, and all the other different senior religious figures. And they were there eating together, celebrating their diversity and their, and their religion together, which I thought was fantastic. You know, and, you, and the governor said, this is where we got to go to. We got to go back to this right there. Uh, so that I, you know, some of these older fellows realize that they, they need to go back there. And, and that in itself is encouraging. You know, because they know what right is, and they understand that. Can I have a follow-up? Um, very quick, very quick. Sure. What is the consequences of not uh, having a peaceful solution? Because the truth is, there's always in the back of mind of everybody who is familiar with the history of Iraq and Kurds, that what is the consequence, what is the, like, inevitable that it will come in a way that it may be everybody take the issue in their own hands rather than solve it peacefully. Yeah. Well, the question, I th the way I look at it is, what's the consequence of a failed state in the middle of the Middle East? Uh, and that is probably even worse than if we had gone there in the first place, having Saddam Hussein regime in place. Uh, Zarqawi's strategy was to have, uh, his strategy was to have a failed state. He wanted to have a failed state so that they can rule with the terrorist groups with, with anarchy so that in phase one, they can have a safe haven to train 
and then in phase two, they can launch attacks to defeat all of the other apostate governments in the, in the region. And Zarqawi, if you remember, attacked into uh, Saudi Arabia, I mean into Egypt in the Sharm el Sheikh Sh Sh attacks. He attacked into Jordan at the wedding attack, and he was already doing his phase two. And then, of course, you know, he, he was himself killed. So what is the consequence of a failed state smack in the Middle East as compared to what is the consequence of having a, it doesn't have to be a Jeffersonian democracy, but having a democratic state in the middle of the Middle East on the eastern flank of a nuclear armed Iran. You know, it's, it, it, it's huge consequences. And it's a very strategic question we have to think about. Thank you. Very good, thank yeah. you. <coughs> so, I'm Melanie Chap from Refugees International. Um, I wanted to follow up on the point you were making about that the PRT's change of role um, to ask if there are specific plans underway for, fu for full transfer of the PRTs from military to civilian agencies and to, to hear a little more about how that would look. Are the apart from the provisional governments, uh, the provincial governments you were talking about, the work with them, is, are there other agencies or partners that you're looking at to be taking over the PRT work? Um, I, I know there's a lot of discussion on what the future of the PRTs are going to be, and I'm not familiar with all the latest discussion. The, the, I, think you I think I heard you say that the PRTs would transfer from the military to the civilian, but uh, the, the PRTs really are, are under the authority of the Department of State, so they are under the authority of, of the state. We, the military, we're, we, we the, this has been very helpful over the last couple of years for us in the United States military to work with the PRTs, to work with our civilian colleagues and to develop those partnership and develop those relationships. And we still have some work to do to develop the doctrine. And I was, was brought to my attention today from the U.S. Institute of Peace that they have proposed some doctrine and they have written us some, some uh, think papers, white papers, on what that doctrine ought to be and how that should look. And, I th and I'm, and it, particularly in my new job at uh, Fort Leavenworth, if I get there, assuming I get conf confirmed by the Senate, that that is one area that I think is important that we look at from doctrinal development. And that is, what is the relationship between uh, the United States and some of these civilian organizations as we, con as we do uh, stability operations? And I, think, and I think that's critically important. But, uh, but I, th I really think that, I, I know there is some discussion that's going on with what the future of the PRT is going to be in Iraq, but I would be an advocate that this is the time to strengthen the PRTs, and this is the time to strengthen the diplomatic effort. Because the 2012, January 1, 2012 relationship is something that will built, be built today and it will be built on our dip, dip, diplomacy, our economic development through reconstruction. And that is really in line with what the PRT's business is all about. So now's the time to, you know, to, we really need more of that <laughs> at this particular time. Very good. Thank you. Clerk. <coughs> oh, yes, sir. Uh, my, uh, my name is uh, Faribor Frank Fuladi from procurementusa.info. We are um, in the process of doing an opportunity village in Najaf. Uh, last time I was in here, General Stone called my project a noble cause. So I'm having American military support. What do I do so I don't alienate myself and the I get the Iraqi uh, uh, security involved? Uh, so after tw uh, 2011, the, 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 these opportunity villages that are free trade zones continue in peace and make sure uh, uh, that we are not alienated in the process. Uh, okay, just to so understand, sir, so you, you are actually developing a project now that you want to implement that project in Iraq? W yes, we are, we are developing something called opportunity village in opportunity, Na opportunity village. Opportunity we, village. Uh, and in these villages we have uh, residential, commercial, as, ve um, as well as the schools and hospitals. Um, but this is free trade zone for 70 years. Uh, as American military lives, and we want to make sure we get the same support from the local securities because we take care of the in internal security for, uh, uh, for exterior security. What do we do diplomatically so we make sure everything goes smooth? by this transition of after 2011. Is that project in Iraq right now? Have you uh, initiated, started uh, it? N not yet, but the governor of Najaf likes our project, so we are going to go there and just find the land which is 800 ah. meter by 800 meter. Down in Najaf. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I th well, first of all, I, to, to get the diplomatic support, the State Department would endorse it and they would ask the embassy to 
have oversight of it. I understand. Uh, and, and I think that that's critically important. We in the military would provide, would initially provide some boots on the ground oversight with our soldiers and be, and provide you the, uh, you know, escorting you to, to do some of the, co the correspondence with some of the local officials, uh, similarly to the way we provide support for the PRTs. The embassy would probably, uh, if they decided to embrace that and support it, then they would probably bring you down to the local PRT and the PRT would have primary responsibility to give you oversight. And then the military um, would provide you the transportation there in the line. So PRT is the, is the point that I need to approach? I would, you know, I, well, first to get the authority in place is, would come with the Department of State. Got it. And then once the Department of State endorsed it, then the embassy would work through, the, you know, to support this. And they would develop the plan to support it. Thank you, Jenna, and thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Wallace Hayes, and I was a Adnan Pachichi's representative here in Washington during the transition. And my question to you is, looking at your four key points, and we certainly hope that those come out the way uh, you suggest they might, but it's not difficult to imagine that they might not all come out that way. And what do we do if there's a new Iraqi government uh, six, 10, 12 months into the future that, acts, that asks the U.S. forces to stay in Iraq. How would you recommend that we respond to that? Um, interesting question. And I don't think that's out of the unreasonable. I think that's a, a that, that could be a reasonable request. Um, it would require a modification of the security agreement. I would just say this. You, first of all, you, Kaslan is a, was a naysayer of leaving Mosul. And I was the one who argued not to do it. And then I, and then when I understood the strategic importance that what General Odierno crammed into my, my head, then I, then, and then I saw it play out. I realized how important the strategic importance was of the security agreement from the Iraqi people's perspective. So if, if uh, the government asks for the United States military to stay in some capacity, the first thing the Iraqi government needs to do is to make the case of the Iraqi people because that would reverse something that they already see as very important to them. The image of me standing with a governor and the governor saying, thank you very much, General, I'm glad I'm standing next to you, but I'd rather stand next to this diplomatic guy. You know, and the governor who said, this is the general who was the army of occupation, now he's the general who's going to build, reconstruct our... Our, our government. You see, it's that it's the MRAP. It's the image of the MRAP that is embedded in the minds of the Iraqi people. And with that, MRAP is an image of occupier and all that sort of thing. And they don't get me wrong; it's not the only image they have. They also recognize how important it was that the American people provide their security. But they also saw the Iraqi military subordinate to the Amer Americans. And when they remove the MRAP and you remove the Americans, then they saw the Iraqi people as providing security. They would question why can't the why can't the Iraqis provide security? We, if we're going to stay in any capacity, would have to probably be in the capacity of the enablers that they feel are necessary to continue those same levels of security. Those enablers would be in intelligence, they might be in aviation, they might be in EOD, they might be in route clearance, uh, and things like that. Um, but I don't see, well, I really don't see Iraqis. Uh, supporting a significant ground force after 2011. Um, that's just kind of my opinion. But they have to make the case for Iraqi people. Yeah. Good, we've got about 10 more minutes, um, and I think we've got about the right number of questions remaining here, so we probably won't take any additional to the people that are here, but please go ahead. Thank you, good morning, sir. My name's Leela Morris with the Department of Defense, and my question goes back to the rule of law. What steps are the government of Iraq taking in Nineveh to counter the corruption with respect to the rule of law, and can you describe the effectiveness? Yeah, that, th that's an area I still are very concerned about is rule of law. Um, <laughs> we address rule of law in all the provinces, but Nineveh province has a huge issue. We, we looked at it from, what we look, we, we look the, you know, I mean, just go back to the fact that, you know, many of these insurgents have been arrested multiple times. As some as many as six to eight times. Um, so it just makes the case for rule of law. It is very exasperating to the Iraqi military. 
it's very exasperating to the Iraqi police. What we tried to do was the, we, a couple things. One is that there was a while before I got there, they tried to build a rule of law complex. And then they, the Iraqi insurgents brought a, um, a V-bit up there and exploded next to it and then they just stopped the project altogether. We started then working, in the timeline, we started working with the Iraqi judges and said, what will provide your security? And they said, we found the niche of where we understand where the red lines are. So they are operating with this, within this area that they know is that they can operate and what, what they can do, what they can't do. Uh, then there was a time where we, uh, Judge Metcalf brought some traveling judges up. So we've got the Baghdad judges up and that was helpful, but the chief judge of Nineveh still controlled the case law. So the cases, he determined where the cases were. We tried to work with him on where the cases ought to go so that we can do some case management and they wouldn't let us do that. Uh, so he still controlled case management. So he knew where the critical cases were and he ensured that they went to the right judges. So that the, the Baghdad judge, traveling judge program had limited effectiveness. They didn't get all the bad guys. You know, because the guy is still going to pay the price for an insurgent who's put away is going to be the judge who lives there. And, th and these guys live under tremendous threats. I mean, it, it is, <laughs> they, know, they all know of their colleagues who were either killed or had family killed. I mean, even while I was there, judges had bombs in their front, I mean, on their front lawns or, or in front of their house, they don't have lawns, or their sticky bombs under their cars that killed, either killed their, one of their colleagues or killed their bodyguard or whatever. Then we work with the judge on what would be an acceptable bodyguard. What, 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 when do you feel you'll have sec enough security? And that was all over the map. We were willing to do every, everything, and even the Iraqi general was willing to do everything. Uh, and that's one of the areas of the future, is to build the Iraqi secure, judicial security system so that they had the capability of providing some sort of security where they felt secure. But they all realized that that was still insufficient because they all know, I mean, the terrorists all know where the judges live. They all know, and regardless of what degree of security you put out there, you know, you, it can easily be penetrated. And they all knew that and they still feared it. Just go back to the judge of Diallo who said, I just want to live one year so I can retire. When you understand the threat and intimidation that they're under and the effect it has on rule of law. Um, then we started, so I said, okay, the, the judges, I mean, the, the generals would show me the cases. And I said, do me a favor, give me the case. And General Odierno's lawyer was good because he would work with Judge Medhaf in Baghdad. And Judge Medhaf wanted to see the cases. So we started taking some of the cases that were presented. And then we, and, and then my lawyer started working with them. We, we translated the case. And the case was terribly prepared. It was understood what the judges need so that we can build the case packets. And then we wouldn't even, at some point, we didn't even want a case to go to the judge if we knew it was not gonna be successful. Because we knew that if it was a, if the case went to the judge and was kicked out, we knew the de devastating effect it had not only on the neighborhood and the people, but also on the, on the military or the police. So we kept that case, uh, we made that, we built the case, we helped them build the cases. And that was starting to have a good effect because the judges were starting to learn what it would take, and, the, and the, I mean, the police were starting to learn what it would take, and the military was starting, le starting to learn what it, what it would take. And so that was one of the things that were important. We also started working on the whole area of forensics. That, but that's only a small subset. Too many, a lot of people are putting a lot of emphasis on forensics, but I'll, trust me, it's just a small subset. They just gotta get the case loads and get, get the case management, management in place first. And that starts to have, but the, none of it will be uh, effective until the judge feels that he, he and his family are secure. And you gotta bring the security levels down, down to do that. There are some provinces, not an issue whatsoever, but Nineveh province is a huge issue, huge issue. We, we will not have security in Nineveh until we fix rule of law. I know it. Thank you, General. My name is uh, Ryan Handy from uh, Department of Defense. And I had a question about um, minorities um, and their rights oftentimes being subsumed by the greater forward or sometimes even backward movement of the GOI and the KRG. Um, with specific uh, question to the Turkmen, um, do you see if they perceive that the KRG and the GOI um, are not interested in promoting their interests or they're not concerned for their interests, a, a continued capacity for Turkmen violence 
within the next two to four to five years? Well, that's a good question. We, <laughs> we thought it was an Arab Kurd issue, and then, we, then all of a sudden we realized how passionate the Kurds were involved in all this stuff. So we're paying attention to the Kurds, and we're paying attention to the Arabs, and then all of a sudden the, the Turks are, Turkmen are, put, are poking their head, and, we, and we finally realized, I mean, I finally realized it. We had a great, uh, the, the deputy police chief of Kirkuk province was a Turk, and he was a very good man, and um, very knowledgeable. He helped educate me personally on, you know, the, the importance of the Turk in, in importance in all this. As what we started doing is we started working issues between Kurds and Arabs. We also became sensitive to the, the, the Turkmen dynamic of that particular issue, and, and that was important. As we started working the security apparatus of Kirkuk province that, you know, the things General Odino was putting in place, the security apparatus. We started working where the checkpoints were where, and what the security zone was going to look like. We, we realized that there is a whole Turk, Turk, Turkmen dimension to that, and there are certain Turkmen villages and, and cities that are primarily Turkmen that, that have to be uh, protected as well. Uh, so the answer is uh, all of our, you know, through our leadership, we became sensitive to it, and we, and through our negotiation dialogues and credit issues, we brought, when applicable, we brought the Turkmen a dynamic to, to that to that discussion. Um, it, but you know they're a minority, it, so whether or not the central government will spend the same energy as we were, uh, I'm not sure that that's going to take some time. I think. You know? uh, my name is Bahar Kadani, and I'm from the Department of State. And my question is, um, I guess, sort of building up on a previous question earlier about the implications of the Iranian government, sort of intervening in Iraqi affairs, especially in the instance of, I believe it was Diyala and supplying the electricity. But we have the Kurdish North who depends so heavily on imports from the, um, from the Turkish government. So what do you think the implications are of that, both negative and, I guess, positive as well? I mean, you can walk through Kurdish marketplaces and it's all Turkish stuff. I mean, even the agricultural well, production is down. So <coughs> what do you do with that? Um, well, you know, Turk, Tur Turkey is opt opp opportunistic and they're taking advantage of uh, the fact that there are a lot of their products and services that are in demand in Iraq, and because Iraq's economy cannot generate those same products and services, they're flooding based on demand. It's a based on a free market. They're flooding the, the, the markets. I th I, 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 frankly, I think it's good because rather than Tur Turkey being in, it, it, it's showing the dependence between the Turkish economy and the Iranian, Iraqi economy, which I think is good. Um, because when you have good, strong economic relationships, you know, that'll tend to justify why you got to uh, also have good, strong security relationships. And when you go back and to understand that the security relationship between Turkey and Kurdistan is, is really tainted by the PKK and the efforts of the PKK, when you have a good, strong economic relationship, you know, that kind of puts some oversight. And, and frankly, this, I believe the strong economic relationship between Turkey and Kurdistan led to some of the successful resolutions we've seen here recently between the PKK in Turkey, you know, the P PKK is good guys going back over there and surrendering and, and giving themselves back there, and they're now Turkey giving some concessions to the Kurdish area and within their country. So I think that's good, but a lot of that I think is as a result of the, of the economic uh, relationship that's been taking place. I always thought it was amazing that there, there, were, there were some major security issues, but there was a strong economic relationship. But sooner or later, within the year we were there, uh, following the the strong economic relationships were, were the development of good security relationships. Not the case between Kurdistan and Iran, though. Mm. <laughs> Even though the PUK, see, if you go back to the P PUK and the PK and, and the um, KDP yeah. war that they had a few years ago, uh, the PUK aligned themselves and got some support out of Iran. So President uh, Talibani's got some ties with Iran. And I always uh, try to understand the depth and level of those ties um, that the Iran had with the PUK. But I'll tell you, the Kurdistan was very cautious. Uh, President Barsan, I know he's KDP and all, but they're all very cautious of, of their relationship with Iran, and they just want to keep that a good relationship, a balanced relationship, you know, and they understand the, the levels of influence there. Thank you. Yep. Good. Last question. <coughs> Sir Kyle Lewis, Department of Defense. Uh, I just want to follow up briefly on something you mentioned earlier. Uh, I'd like to know how significant of a role did U.S. forces play in the uh, de-escalation at Camp Ashraf over the summer? And do you believe that uh, Prime Minister Maliki is under pressure, perhaps by the Iranians, to address this issue uh, before par parliamentary elections? I understand his stated goal to address it in December, but this has been kicked down the road a couple times. I hope it is. It's a lose-lose situation. 
uh, we know the only thing that we, <laughs> that was my area, so I was in the middle of all that. So the, the only area thing we did on the, the, rec the time that they went in there, <coughs> from the 5th Iraqi Army and the Iraqi police into Ashraf, was just strictly humanitarian. And, uh, you know, when all those guys were injured and, and killed, you know, we, we did all the medical evacuation and return them and all that sort of thing. Um, the, what we've been doing, well, f well, the one good thing from a military standpoint is Ambassador Hill has embraced it, the problem. And he has, he and the embassy have now embraced with the Maliki government through discussion and to guide them on, on proper steps and how to get this thing resolved. The Maliki government is under strong influence of Iran to get that thing resolved. And he, I believe he feels that he ought to get it resolved before the election. That will put, if he does get it resolved, it's success, separate, successfully resolved from his point of view, it will put him in a better standing. I would argue that it, it will never be successfully resolved through violence. It just is not going to. It's a lose-lose situation. It's a Jim Jones, uh, Waco situation that is not going to be resolved successfully. Um, and we just <laughs> talked to those uh, MEK, and that's their stated objective is to die in place. And that is, that is not good. They will not be relocated or anything like that. So therefore, um, I, I think Melky, I, I thought he had an objective, a state objective to resolve in December for the elections, and I'm anxious to see if he will or not. I, I'd, if it was me, if I was advising him, I'd say it's, uh, just, it's not worth it. I mean, it's a lose-lose. You may think it's going to help you, but I, it's a lose-lose. Would, would you rather see it take place while, we were, while U.S. forces were still present inside of Iraq, though? Would that help facilitate that peacefully, ideally? Um, we can facilitate to try to make have a peaceful resolution. I'm not optimistic there will be a peaceful resolution. One thing we are effective at, Ambassador Hill and his discussions with Maliki is effective at helping him to understand the problem, I believe. The work I personally did is I talked to the police chief who was going in there, and I personally talked to the military guy who was going in there, and I started talking about, what do you, okay, say you get the order to do this, how are you going to do it? Let's talk through this thing. And I tried to... That we we kind of did an after-action review of the last effort they did when they crashed the gate and started shooting everybody and, you know, all the other nonsense. And then we said, what, what did we gain out of that? What did we learn? Now, what's the best? If you really have to do this, what's the best way to do it? And that, that was, but, I, but we, my, my rules of engagement are very clear from an American standpoint if they actually go back in there. And we'll support them on a humanitarian standpoint. But in the meantime, we, we understand that the strategic importance and how critically important that is. And, and we are, I felt to be necessary to be fully engaged to advise them on how best to try to resolve this thing and how to balance all the different influences that they were getting and, and, and encouraging them to do. Joe so, Kasman, that <laughs> I, we could go on here and probably will. Um, but let me, on behalf of both the people here um, and on behalf of the Institute of Peace, thank you very much for spending that much time. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>